Hello and welcome to the show. Hi everyone, welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're glad that you have joined us and we've got a great show for you today. I can see three really talented, intelligent folks to my left. Let's hope it works out. <laughs> and I'll tell you who I am. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Science Department in the College of ACES. So I'll answer cut flower questions, maybe something about perennials and landscaping. But we have three more folks here, so let's throw it over to you, Chuck Voigt. Hello, Diane. I am Chuck Voigt. I'm also in the uh, Crop Sciences Department. My specialties are vegetables and herbs. Um, and in fact, I brought some things that I rescued from the cold. Um, as the, as the seed catalogs come in for next year, I want you to keep Swiss chard in mind because even if you don't have any interest in eating it, it is just so fantastically beautiful. The color saturation in the petioles, you get these reds, you get, you get oranges, you get all sorts of other, other great uh, uh, things going on. Uh, if you are interested in eating it, it, it it's great. You can, you can use the leaf blades layer them in, in lasagnas and things like that, like you, you do for spinach. The, the, the petioles take a little longer to cook, but they're also, also pretty good. It's a really great uh, crop because you plant it in the cool season and it, you can start harvesting it while it's still cool season. It holds up pretty well with water mm -hmm. and fertilization through the warm part of the growing season and then really grows like crazy in the, in the cool, moist fall. And so you can get a, a, a very long season where spinach or something is only a couple of weeks in the spring and, and maybe a few weeks longer in the fall. But Swiss chard is, uh, is really cool. The variety of the colors together just in a row looks so good. Looks great in pots. Right. Yeah, Bright Lights is, is the All-America mm -hmm. Selection variety that, mm -hmm. that has, has a pretty good uh, color variety. I like that idea of layering it in lasagna. <laughs> Never thought about that. Sounds good. Well, good. Thank you for bringing the Swiss chard. All right. We were talking about pronunciation, and there it is, Swiss chard. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to you in the middle, Mark Kemp. Hello. My name is Mark Kemp. I'm a landscape architect. I can answer questions on design, trees, shrubs, perennials, you know, anything in particular there. Um, I'm going to answer an email. Uh, this is specifically about a catalpa tree, but it'll uh, correspond to other things. Our catalpa tree is a large, is large and ha produces good shade. The problem is we don't like the flowers and the beans. Is there a way to stop the tree from flowering in the spring and stop the bean pods in the fall? Technically, yes, but that's really not the problem. Um, Obviously, if there's a nuisance like the pod um, or the bean pod or in other cases like an acorn, it's really the choice. So obviously, it sounds like this tree was inherited to the site. Um, the tree in itself, a catalpa, is going to get so large that the, the means to eliminate flowers and eliminate pods is not going to be manageable. Um, so usually, it's just solving the problem that the pods might create. So you could do like a mulch bed underneath and that would be easier to clean up the pods and not be so much of a, a maintenance nightmare or something like that. Um, but really it all starts in the beginning and that's selecting the right tree um, so that you don't get a situation that is unpleasant or unsafe. Um, you know, acorns next to a sidewalk, uh, other means, you know, like that. Flowers, they're really nice, but sometimes then they can create a situation that's not pleasant. So, we so plan ahead. We inherited a catalpa from mulch. I think that's how it came yeah. in because we didn't have any. So and then you don't want to let it get too large. So it, it it's manageable happened. at the beginning, but once the, the tree itself gets up beyond a certain point, then you're going to lose all control over that. Okay, Mark, very good advice. Proper selection, right yep. plant, right place. Okay, all right, we've got a smiling person next <laughs> to me. Let's find <laughs> out who it is. Why, it's Shane Cultra. Uh, Hi, Shane. Hi, I am <laughs> Shane Cultra, and I am one of the family owners of Country Arbor's Nursery and Culture Nurseries uh, in Urbana, Illinois, and Onarga, Illinois. And uh, pretty much my whole life, we've grown perennials, shrubs, trees. Uh, we do Christmas trees, snow pong. So if it's outside, I'm pretty much there, and I can answer a little bit about everything because that's what we do all the time. And I have a show and tell. And normally this time of year, this is a great product to be using because it's very versatile. But one of the best things, it's an anti-desiccant. This is probably the most popular brand called Wiltproof. 
But basically what it does is it keeps the water in a plant. It keeps a little wax coating on that plant and protects it from a number of things, but winter is one of them. Uh, a lot of people last year had some problems with things burning, evergreens burning, things that keep their leaves or broad leaves, lose their water or it freezes, and this product here sprayed on it helps that. Uh, it does, it's not foolproof, but it certainly helps. If you have boxwoods and hollies and rhododendrons and other things along those, this is perfect for that. Uh, also, if you're moving a plant when you shouldn't move it, spraying this on it keeps the water in the leaves so you can move it without it drying out and dying. So it helps in that, in that way as well. So it's really good product. One thing, don't use it when it's below freezing. You have to watch the temperatures. Spraying it in central Illinois this next week would not be a great idea. You need to get a little warmer. But it's really a helpful thing and we highly recommend it on evergreens and hollies and all these things that burn up uh, in the past. And this will do a good job preventing okay. it. Thank you very much You're for that. You're very welcome. We've got the whole gamut of cold things and warm things and what to do when. Well, let's go to a Did You Know segment next. There are small pockets of air inside cranberries that causes them to bounce and float in water. Okay. Now we want to go to the phone lines and let's see what Mary Lynn has for us. A question about, I think, Christmas cactus on line two. Hi, Mary Lynn. Hi there. Uh, please help. Okay. Um, I had a Christmas cactus, a very beautiful, I've had it several years, had it outside, brought it in uh, about two weeks ago, and now it's in full, full bloom. How can I get it to wait until Christmas? Oh, boy. Okay. Well... <laughs> Part of the problem is they sell Thanksgiving cactus as Christmas cactus because it works better from a merchandising standpoint. Shane might be able to uh, address that. But uh, the Thanksgiving cactus is programmed to flower around Thanksgiving. And it's great if you want to sell plants on the promise of Christmas, but, but th that's the case. Christmas cactus usually is better about waiting till at least December. So I don't know if what you have is a true Christmas cactus or if it's, if it's not. Uh, a true Christmas cactus has rounded lobing on, on, the, on the stem segments where the, the, uh, the Thanksgiving cactus has pointed segments on, on there. And, you know, unless, unless you're willing to do some pretty complicated day length maneuvering, I don't know that you're going to keep a Thanksgiving cactus from blooming until Christmas. I know I do wait quite a bit to bring my Christmas cactus in, which was just very recently. But yeah, there's Thanksgiving, there's Christmas, and there's Easter. Yes. Cactus. And I'm pretty sure Christmas is like next week because of all the advertising I've seen. Oh. So it really doesn't sound that far <laughs> off. Maybe that's it. Yeah, everything's moved forward. <laughs> I've I'm going with the Thanksgiving cactus answer. Okay, I think, yeah, yours is probably If we get to answer. choose. <laughs> so you may want to get another plant and actually have a Thanksgiving and a Christmas cactus and then yeah. get one for Easter. Okay, thank you so much for that question, Mary Lynn. Now let's go to line one, and Marsha's going to ask us something about geraniums. Hi, Marsha. Good evening. Hi. Uh, I'd like to know, we brought in our geraniums potted and in the basement. How often should we water and how much water, and then do we cut off the blooms now? Well, you don't, you don't have to. I mean, you, when you bring them inside, they'll probably, they could bloom all winter long, but they're definitely going to go towards the drier side in the winter. And, and it'll naturally go that way anyway, just because the, the basement's probably a drier spot during the winter, because a lot of people use humidifiers down there anyway. But we, I kind of do the same way. I don't let them go bone dry and turn so the pot comes away, the dirt comes mm -hmm. away from the pot. So I let it dry out almost completely and then water it. So I, you don't want it to you're not going to get it to grow real well in the basement um, but it you do want to keep some moisture on you don't ever want to let it go bone dry and you can cut the flowers off but i it'll probably bloom i'm always surprised mm -hmm. how begonias and geraniums bloom the whole winter down in the basement with some if you have light so if it decides not to just let it do that naturally yeah <clears throat> but let it flower until then okay thanks so much marcia for that question and now let's go next to a lawn question and tom is on line three hello tom Hello, I, I, I really enjoy your program. Thank you. And I'm thinking spring already. Excellent attitude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got some low spots in the yard, and uh, I'm thinking about bringing in some black dirt. 
and probably four, six inches deep in some areas. Now, do I have to bring up, tear out the old side, or can I just put it on top and then seed it? You can do that all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can, but you're still going to get a little bit of uh, kind of interference between there. It helps to, to tear up the area a little bit. That way you kind of get a, a good mix with the topsoil you're adding. Um, you get good drainage through. There's a good exchange. Um, a little bit of work will go a long way with results. And that way it just, the water goes through yeah. and it incorporates. You don't have to take it all up, but if you tear it up and uh, mix it in well together, you should be good. Okay. Well, I like that spring attitude already, yeah. talking about the lawns. Okay, now we're going to go to a white pine question on line two with Walter. Hi there, Walter. Hi. Um, I have a very mature white pine, actually several white pines in my uh, yard. This particular tree is about 30 feet high and probably about 50 inches in diameter. About the middle of the summer, it developed a white powdery substance on the trunk and limbs. Uh, it looked like talcum powder. Uh, it's a kind of a moist area back there. And I'm wondering if that might have been the cause of this or if the tree needs uh, uh, some sort of a treatment. Hmm. It, but it wasn't a sappy type because they, they, the barks often gets real sappy, on a, especially a white pine. Um, the the substance I'm talking about was almost like somebody sprinkled baby powder on the tree. Hmm. A very heavy coat of it. Now, that one that one's out of my realm too. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, I don't know if that. it could have been a white mold or not. Well, uh, depends on how damp it was. It shouldn't. White white pines typically don't have a whole lot of mm -mm. Um, issues that way. I think you might have stumped us, Walter. That doesn't sound familiar. Because yeah. they are very tough trees. So if we yeah. find out any of our disease um, plant pathologist colleagues let us know, we will certainly check back with you. White mold was pretty strong in the area White and mold? crops, but uh, it could have just kind of ventured out of a field a little bit. Hmm. Interesting. So we're not sure, but that is, we're hazarding a guess, and there it is. All right, so thank you for those questions. Let's go back around to a show and tell Ooh. for you, Chuck, if you <coughs> are ready. I'm getting there. I brought in some celery as well. First of all, we have just more or less a, a standard, I think this is a variety, Utah, some, some number. And I tell my classes and anybody else who will listen <laughs> that we don't do a particularly marvelous job of growing celery here. Um, the, the petioles don't get as big and thick as, as we would like, and then you need to tie it up and, and blanch it out so that they get lighter in color. What you can do, the flavor is just is just really intense, and if you're going to use it for, for anything else other than stuffing the petioles, it, it's just fine. Um, and then we, in the trial we had a red celery, which is reddish, and I think probably... If, it, if you were to blanch that and the green went away, the red would become um, more prominent. Uh, it's not as vigorous as, as, as the other, but uh, if you were looking for a, a novelty item, that might, that might work. I'm kind of hung up. And then finally, we've got uh, celery root or celeriac or celeriac, depending on pronunciation. And it just gets a nice kind of craggy looking root. It's kind of ugly mm -hmm. on the outside. You would peel that, put it in, in uh, acidulated water so that it doesn't, doesn't oxidize, and then again, use it in soups and stews and, and whatever. Um, so my recommendation would be, if you're gonna grow celery, you know, grow it as a, as a flavoring, not as, as what we normally, normally use celery for. We just can't keep up with the grocery store in that regard. Mm -hmm. I've, I've never in my whole gardening life had anything that was even remotely close to that. We do a good job with this. This didn't get particularly big this year. They can get as big as a 16-inch softball or even, even larger. And, and so the, the root celery, we do well. There's also a, 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 an herbal variety that's a leaf celery that's a little finer textured yet than this. And uh, we can do a good job with that and, and you know, dry the leaves and use them in, in different ways. But, but 
This is probably as, as good a celery as I've had in several years, and it's, it's not spectacular. So celery likes a little cooler <coughs> summer and moist? It likes a cooler summer. It likes to be moist but never wet. Okay. This summer we were... We were wet. This was at the wet end of a, of a wet summer <laughs> field, so it, didn't, it wasn't particularly happy with that. Uh, it, it didn't ever dry out, which was good, but it, I think the aeration was a problem for part of the season. And I don't know why this one uh, branched so much on the sides. We got all of these, all these little side shoots coming off the side, and I, I don't know if that was a response to stress or, or what was going on with that. And but. then the other, is Lovage the herb you're talking about, or is there no, another? No, there's a leaf celery. A leaf celery. So there is lovage, which is a perennial. Right. It does self sow though. And at least has, in my garden. Uh, lovage is, is interesting because it has round, hollow stems, and if you make your bloody marys or whatever, you can you can use it as a stirrer, but also as a straw. Aha. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I see. So we are learning a lot about celery-like <laughs> things. Okay. Well, good. I have not seen the red celery before. That was interesting. Okay, thanks, Chuck. And now let's go to you next, Mark. Okay. I have another email here. Um, my iris plant has been reblooming, or has been blooming in early spring for four years, and I noticed that it is, is blooming now, again this year. What's up with the iris blooming twice in 2014 from um, Jan? Uh, yes, there are reblooming iris. Uh, the, th the factors that will go into whether they do rebloom or not are cultural or weather related. Uh, whether there's consistent moisture, uh, whether there's a cool period. Um, so you won't always get that reblooming time. So the four years prior may have just led you to believe that it was a single bloom um, iris, but in this case, it sounds like it is a reblooming iris and you just had conditions this year that allowed it to get to that stage where it gave you that pleasant second bloom, so. Very nice. Not yep. always does it happen. Nope. And, so it's, and it's a little freaky to, to, to see them blooming in September or whatever. Yes. It's, it's, your mind is set on them being in But in other May. flowers that bloom in September may not bloom next year, but the iris right. yeah. will be a And there's a lot of good re-blooming iris mm -hmm. out there. I mean, they, they tout them as ones that'll come again. So there's some that are better than others. So yeah, the you, earlier ones weren't so yeah. good. So yeah. planting had there, uh, choosing the right variety, then fertilizing after the first bloom, giving consistent moisture, and you have a better chance. Okay, very good. And now Shane. I've got a, a great question here. Uh, someone, it would be Scotty May, has a question about the, uh, his 20-year-old sweet gum. And this spring, it did not look as good as it did the previous years. It was beautiful in the fall and summer of the years before, but wondered what happened to it. Was it uh, no obvious signs of trauma or insect damage, but it did not look good and wanted to know if it was the winter and you hit it right on the head. Sweet gum suffered terribly with last year's winter. Last year's winter across the Midwest was much, much more than normal. That's the easiest way to say it. It was much colder, much more snow, much more of everything, and there were some plants that suffered, and sweet gum was definitely one of them. Black gum, younger black gums really suffered. Um, we even had some sycamores and, and things that normally just don't have too many problems really did suffer last year. And, and sweet gum is right on that border anyway for this mm -hmm. area. So it, it always is going to be a little temperamental, but it usually grows so fast if you lose a couple branches here and there, it comes right back. Happy Days is a, a seedless sweet gum that's very popular. And it pr probably took a little more hit than just a regular sweet gum. So not a lot you can do about it. Just hope it doesn't happen again and uh, you know, continue to plant hardy varieties. But we all know we like to play a little bit with the zone and have something a little different than our neighbors. But when you do that, expect to have some issues when it gets negative 50 degrees. Oh boy. And some parts of the country are getting negative. Already, so. that's a good test early. Oh, yeah. oh boy. All right, well let's uh, see what we have for the mag quiz. What general term is given to the trees and shrubs whose leaves fall in autumn? A. Deciduous B. Evergreen C. Ambidextrous A. Deciduous Deciduous trees tend to lose their leaves seasonally, mostly during the fall. This happens when leaves are no longer needed and have finished their purpose. This is the natural process for plants. All right, speaking of deciduous trees, let's go to Cynthia with an oak tree question on line four. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, 
I have a huge oak tree in my yard, and whenever we have a good soaking rain, um, after the rain, one side of the bark is really bright green, almost iridescent. So I was just wondering if that's a fungus or something I should be concerned about, or should I have it looked at by a professional arborist? We see, we, I get this question all the time. That's just a natural green moss that grows on the tree. You've ever heard the saying that moss grows on this, the north side, I think mm -hmm, it is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we get people bringing in branches, and it's like a little furry, bright green, teal moss. And some trees can get absolutely coated in it. And every time they bring it in, I take them out the back door through the kitchen and show them a tree just coated in it to make them feel better. It's completely <laughs> natural, no loss to the tree at all. Um, and it looks a little odd, especially like you said, when it gets wet and the sun hits it perfectly, it really shines, but there's no problem at all. Just enjoy its beauty. Yes, I like the way you describe that green on the side of the tree, because yeah. it's just what right. you would see in woods and forests. And yeah. yep. So enjoy it. That's the answer for uh, from us to you. All right, now let's go to Nora's question, and she has a question about a rose on line one. Hi, Nora. Yeah, uh, this is Nora from Arcola. Okay. I was wondering if it's necessary to cut your rose bushes back and how short you should cut them back. Okay, Mark, we're going to yell mm. over to you about <laughs> should we prune roses right now? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Chuck? Nope. Shane? No, I, I bring them, I'll bring them back a little bit occasionally, get that big scraggler that's sticking out, and I will take it and maybe make it look a little prettier for winter, but I leave the heavy pruning until spring when I yeah. see a little bit of green coming out because I always say you're probably gonna lose half your rose on a hard mm -hmm. winter. Right. It's better to lose half a rose that's three foot tall than a rose that's six inches tall. Oh yeah. And it also catches all the leaves and, the, it, and that, it, pr it catches its it own helps. protection. 12 yes. plastic bags from Myers. Comes in. Wow. Maybe that's just me, but it does catch a lot of stuff, but that's great for the plant. It protects it, and that's why you keep grasses. Same reason, keep the grasses uh, up. And even letting uh, fall mums collect leaves is good for them. Now, yeah. I, the only thing I harvest, I mean, cut on roses, are to maybe harvest rose hips occasionally right. for decorative items. But As Shane said, or a wild, wild yeah, branch that I goes get one that was three foot taller than the rest yeah. of it. That's a whole different thing, but yeah. that's some of the things you don't want to do. Grasses, roses. Yep, yep. Probably other Hy things. Hydrangeas occasionally. That's mm -hmm. a whole show on hydrangeas. But yeah, that's right. you definitely. You can always do a little maintenance, a little trimming, make it look good for winter, make you know shape it up a little bit. But you don't want a hard prune. Don't get carried away. Yeah, don't get too excited. Okay, well we're gonna uh, sneak one more question in about sunset maples from Steve on line three. Hi, Steve. What's your question for us, Steve? Hi. Uh, my question is, I have a sunset maple that's probably 10 to 15 years old now, and the bark is cracking in a vertical mm -hmm. matter, you know, from top to bottom, and I was wondering if that was normal. There's one that one. I, I get that one too often as well. <laughs> you sell them, so you yeah. don't want to answer it. Yeah, I'm just praying it's not mine. <clears throat> well... I think a lot of a lot of trees are, are subject to, to frost cracking, mm -hmm. particularly on the southwest side, when the trunk is frozen and the sun shines on it. Uh, the outside expands faster than the inside, and, and it can it sounds almost like a rifle shot when it when it when it lets go. Um, I think it's fairly typical of a tree that's been grown in a nursery and and has guys like itself around it to shade it. You take it and put it out in the open. It it kind of you know, and even if years has been there for for ten or more years, that exposed trunk is 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 kind of still kind of gray, still kind of smooth, uh, and the sun hits it, and and like last last winter particularly again, <clears throat> because it was so cold, mm -hmm. I think uh, probably made that even more likely than usual. Um, I don't know. Is yeah, there, the, other, the other thing is, is the other thing is maple bore. It's a huge problem <coughs> in, in new neighborhoods. The the stress and the drought really made them, uh, subjected them to uh, maple bores. And you can tell the difference, like you said, the south uh, west side will be where the, the uh, busting open, that's, that's a sun scald. It's always in the exact same spot. You take due south, move a little to the left, that would be your frost crack. But maple bore doesn't pick it that way. It's all over. When you peel away that peely bark and look, you're gonna see holes. 
And that can be treated with imidacloprid, but you have to get it sooner than later. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's very prevalent, especially in the newer neighborhoods in the clay soils. So if any of the frost crack bark peels, you yeah. do want to trim it away, you know, on yeah. the frost crack, but trim it away in a very nice, neat way so it, it has a chance to yeah. heal. And they'll heal up. It happens to oh, it, yeah. trees. It happens it's all very the time. common on maple. And catching it early, like you said. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't want that to continue on for too right. long. And spraying Roundup on the trunk will cause it to frost crack much easier. Oh, yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> People try and clean up around it. you got to be careful on that. But watch for the bugs first. Watch for the, the frost cracking. Okay. Uh, it'll heal, but you got to catch it. It is not early. normal. It's just common. No, nothing. No, yeah, exactly. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's what we tell our kids. So. Well, thank you so much for watching. I want to thank you three for being here. And we hope you get out and have still some fun gardening outside. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.